Hello and welcome to the Joy of Development. Today we'll be starting a new method for procedurally generated rooms. In the previous episodes, we created rooms that spawn in a mostly square shape. This works great and will cover most of your needs. That said, some shape variety can go a long way in making your environment feel more engaging. As you can see with this new method, we're going to generate rooms that come in a wide variety of shapes. To keep up with this project and more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. And don't forget to smash that like button. The first thing we need is a blueprint structure. You can make these by right-clicking down here, going up to Blueprints, and then selecting Structure. A structure is essentially a group of variables contained within a single variable. You can add new variables with the button at the top, give them a name, and then change their type to whatever you need. You can also give them default values down below. In my case, I have an int vector variable that we've called location, and an integer variable we've named rotation. We're doing this because we need our variables to maintain consistency. Regular vectors and rotations are often off by a few decimal places. And our rotation's just a single integer because we'll only be affecting the yaw value. We'll also only be using the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3 because everything's going to be done in 90 degree rotations. So we'll just multiply those four numbers by 90 degrees. I've also made some custom static meshes for this. They're basically the same as the doorway, the door, the wall, and the floor that Unreal comes with. The major difference is that I've given them a different pivot point that I think's easier to work with on a project like this. I've thrown them all on an actor so I can demonstrate what I'm talking about. All of these meshes have their pivot point at the center of the floor. The wall and doorway are placed away from the pivot point at the floor's edge. This way, when rotated around its center axis by 90 degree increments, it will always end up on one of the floor's edges. I'll make the wall visible and change its static mesh to Unreal Engine's wall mesh. As you can see, its pivot point is in the lower corner. Giving the meshes these pivot points is going to make positioning them a lot easier. As for the door's pivot point, it's positioned at its hinge so that when we open and close it, it can rotate simply around its center axis. We also only have to worry about its position within the door actor, which is easy to do by just placing it inside the doorway. Speaking of the door actor, I've created a new one to fit specifically this mesh. I've also created a new wall collision to fit the new walls. If we open up the door actor and look at its viewport, you can see that the doorway mesh has a location of zero. As for the door, we've just repositioned its location to fit within the doorway. We've also had to make some minor adjustments to the door's code. First, we're no longer rotating the door around a scene component. So we swapped out the scene and just put the door in there. Next, we've had to change the actors that we cast to in our hallway function. We've changed them to door one and wall collision one. Also be sure to adjust the names in the switch before it. And we've had to adjust some of the vectors in our math to make sure that they fit the dimensions of our new meshes. We've made these changes here, 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 and here. Finally, we didn't make any changes to the code for our wall collision. I just adjusted it to fit the new meshes. Now with all that explained and out of the way, let's jump into our room actor and check out what's going on. We've got a few new variables, most of which are arrays of tile transforms, the struct we made earlier. And up top, I'm just clearing them all away to make sure that if I was doing any testing in the construction script, it all gets reset before I preview the game. As before, we start off by setting up our random stream, and then from there we'll jump into our new function. I call this the floor plan method, so I've named the function floor plan room. The first thing we'll do here is establish the grid. This does the same thing as the nested for loop in our other method, except with this technique we only use a single for loop and a little bit of math. We do this by multiplying the room tiles x by the room tiles y and subtracting one to get the total number of tiles that our room can have. We run that through a for loop, for each of the indexes, we'll divide it by room tiles y to get our row. Then we'll modulo it by room tiles y to get our columns. We then add the result to the tile array, and when all of this is complete, we set the variable unplaced tiles to the tile array. Now we don't actually want to place the tiles yet, but for demonstrational purposes, I've set up a little test over here, so you can see it's working exactly as intended. So we'll preview the game and look around, and as you can see, everything's working as expected. Now we can move on to our next function, which is setting the door tiles. So we'll connect that up and jump inside. The first thing we do in here is establish our perimeter tiles. 
We run a for loop for our y-axis and our x-axis, and we'll follow that up with a door spacing macro. The door spacing macro was in our previous technique, it just wasn't a macro yet. If we go back and look right here, you can see we've already used the same code. From there we go into a sequence where we establish the parallel perimeter tiles. The left and right side both use the index as their x location, and the right side has a y location of room tiles y minus 1. We give the left side a rotation of 1, and we give the right side a rotation of 3. For our top and bottom sides, we have a few conditions. We don't want to spawn a door on our entryway, and we also don't want to spawn a door on the top side if it's a hallway. For the bottom wall, we'll set its y location to the index, and we'll give it a rotation of 0. For the top side, x location is room tiles x minus 1, y location is the index, and it'll have a rotation of 2. After all that's established, we can select which perimeter tiles will get turned into doors. We'll run a for loop off door count minus 1. And for each loop, we're going to get a random perimeter tile. To do that, we'll get the last index of the perimeter tile, and we'll get a random number between 0 and that number. We'll then use that number to get a random copy of one of the perimeter tiles. Then we're going to add that to our door array and remove it from the perimeter tiles. With our door array finished, we can now start constructing our doors. We'll multiply the location by 400, and we'll multiply the rotation by 90. We'll convert the int vector into a normal vector, and we'll plug the results of our rotation into the yaw of a make rotator node. Then, just to double check, we're going to make sure that there's not already a wall there. This check wall macro is basically the same as our last one. We've changed what we cast to, and we've changed the math to make sure that it fits our new meshes. And just like last time, so long as there's no door or wall, we can move on and spawn our new door. We'll convert the location and the rotation into world space, we'll give it a seed, and we'll give it its location information from its room tile. Now after we've spawned all the doors, we also want to add our entry location to the door array. This will be necessary for what we're covering in the next video. For now, let's preview the game and see what's going on. As you can see, a number of doors have spawned around the perimeter of the floor. Alright, that about covers it for this video. In the next one, we'll be going over paths and making sure that the player has access to every door in the room. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.